Thanks to everyone for turning out today. It's great to be here. I used to call this the land down under. These days I refer to it as over yonder. <laughs> I've probably lost half the audience there already. So, Anyway, uh, nearly didn't make it. Had a flight cancellation this morning coming in from Brisbane. It was a bit stressful, but I managed to get myself another flight evidently. So here I am. So let's get stuck in, shall we? So this title is this uh, talk is loosely titled "Music's Mind Control and Military Connections." I've just noticed a literal in the word "presentation," so I should have checked that. Don't focus too much on it. But um, this raises our first question of the day: Why should there be any connection whatsoever between music, mind control, and the military? If all that popular music is about is harmless fun and entertainment. Well, the truth of the matter is that it's all about a little bit more than that when we're talking about the controlled corporate music industry, and there'll be plenty of evidence presented this afternoon to reinforce that point. So my background, as some of you may know, is as a club and radio DJ. I did it for many years. It was my full-time job for 20-odd years. I came to Australia six times between 2003 and 2009 and absolutely loved it. Played a few clubs in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, a few other places. Last time I was here was 2009. Been wanting to get back for a while. This tour was planned with expert precision timing for March 2020. <laughs> and I think we all know why I didn't get here then. There was a point where I thought I was never going to travel internationally again. I'm sure many of you felt the same. Uh, but I saw a window of opportunity to get out here this month and deliver these talks and seized it. So here we are. So I continued as a DJ for many years and the only things that really mattered to me were the next gig, the next party, all the hot tunes, all the hot clubs. But round about 2007, I started to get to uh, some big questions about what this world was really all about. Pretty much the biggest questions you can ask. Who's really running things? To what ends? What are all these agendas about? What are we? What are we doing here? What is this place anyway? And I got led on to the books of David Icke. My dad put me on to him. He'd been reading them and he recommended that I looked at his material. So I did and I found that what was contained in his work answered many of the questions that I'd had up to that point, such as why is there always war injustice, tyranny, suffering, famine, hardship in the world. Why should that be? And I came to realize that it's that way because it's been set up to be that way by the real controllers of organized society. And these are not the people that we're entrained to think of as the controllers, i.e. governments. I quickly came to realize that there are networks, groups sitting above governments which are dictating to them the activities that they will undertake. I came to realize also that these groups, these networks, these individuals are at their, car, their core dark occultists, <coughs> Satanists, Luciferians and other groups. This was pretty unsettling but it set me on a path of research and what I wanted to comprehend was how this dynamic played out in the world of music, popular culture and entertainment of which I'd been a part. So I made that my specialist area of interest, fell down about 5,000 different rabbit holes all at the same time. You might be familiar with the process. And my initial five years worth, oh, this is me in Sydney in 2003, by the way, my first visit to Australia. I've hardly changed, I know. <laughs> but uh, that was the initial flyer that I knocked up quite a while back. So my first five years worth of research led to the publication of my first Musical Truth book. This came out in early 2016. I self-published 
because no conventional publisher was ever going to touch it with the material that it contained. And it summed up everything that I'd come to learn about how the music industry is used for mass mind control, social engineering, and the pushing of globalist agendas. I wrote two more books in that series, but we're going to concentrate today on content from all three. And my research initially took me a long way back, all the way to the mid-1950s. I pinpoint 1955 as the start of many of these current day agendas. So in 55, you had a landmark record, Rock Around the Clock, by Bill Haley and his Comets. It used to be Bill Haley and the Comets, but that's the Mandela effect for you. More of that in other talks. So this record was very different to anything which had gone before it in American society. So in the early 1950s, it was the post-war era. Things were very austere, very sort of solemn. And all of a sudden, there was this explosion of youth culture. In that year, there were three landmark movies, Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean, The Blackboard Jungle, and the movie version of Rock Around the Clock. And all of these were squarely aimed at what were termed teenagers. Prior to the mid-1950s, the word teenager was not in common parlance, but it was created. It was created by social engineers. We'll be meeting plenty of them as we go on. And the idea was to change culture. The generation that they had in their sights was the young people of the day, because it always is. Young people are way more malleable than their older counterparts. By the time you get to my age, you're a bit cynical, you're a bit jaded, you've seen a thing or two, and you learn to spot an agenda when it comes along. But when you're in your formative years, you're much easier to control. So this was the birth of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll lifestyle. And it was all about pitting the young people of the time against the value system of their generation. The social engineers love to do this, to foment discord between the generations, between different groups in society. They've been doing it for a very long time, but for the purposes of my research, I take it back to the mid-50s. Many of the early record labels who put out the first rock and roll superstars had their origins in the world of the military. So here's the first of so many connections into those institutions. One that we can look at is RCA, which was Elvis Presley's record label. It stands for the Radio Corporation of America, and it was developed by the US Navy. Initially, they were developing new systems of radar, sonar, radio technology, different sonics, this type of research. And then it morphed into a record label where many of these big stars were put out. Another one from Britain is EMI, Electrical Mechanical Industries. In this excerpt from the brilliant book by Daniel Estelin on the Tavistock Institute, we'll be meeting Tavistock as we go along, don't worry. Uh, he talks about the proprietor of EMI being an aristocrat by the name of Sir Joseph Lockwood. I'll give you a heads up. We're going to be meeting lots of sirs in this story, okay? Sirs figure very strongly. So this was a military contractor to the British War Office engaged in similar activities to RCA, but on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So the first rock and roll superstar can be argued to have been Elvis Presley. His career launched in 1956 with his debut record. And he was taking black forms of music, rhythm and blues, and making it palatable for a white mainstream audience 
in America and beyond. Not the first time that's been done, and neither the last. His manager was a guy who went by the name of Colonel Tom Parker. We see him here on the left. Some of you may have seen the film recently, directed by Baz Luhrmann, in which Parker was portrayed by Tom Hanks. So a lot of mystery surrounds this guy. Not much is known about his background. He was a Dutchman and he came over to the United States, evidently without the proper papers and with a very shady, dubious background. But he ended up as Elvis Presley's manager. Now my research has borne out that the word manager so often is interchangeable with the word handler when we get into mind control. And we'll be focusing some more on that in part two. It seems that anyone who was anyone in those early days of rock and roll had to have an affiliation, a relationship with Sir Jimmy Savile. I take it everyone in the room knows about Jimmy Savile's extracurricular activities, right? So we don't need to recap on those. Just suffice to say that he was a prolific paedophile and necrophiliac. He was a DJ and television presenter who was on British TV screens for around 50 years. Worked for the BBC, those nice people, you know. The BBC is actually a state propaganda broadcasting arm of the British government. It's actually a division of MI6. It's closely linked to Tavistock and it's all about mind control. Unfortunately, where you find trauma-based mind control, you so often find connections to pedophilia, such as through Savile, and dark occult ritualistic activities. All of this can be shown to be true, all of it can be backed up, there's documentation, there's testimonies to show that this is the case. So here's Elvis Presley hanging out with Jimmy Savile, who by the way was not exposed until after he had died. He got away with it his entire life. The truth only came out a year after he'd passed away. Wonder what his life review was like. Here's Sir Jimmy Savile with Sir Cliff Richard, count him. So Cliff Richard in his early days was marketed as a sort of British Elvis Presley, believe it or not. With his first single Move It in 1958, he was kind of emulating Elvis Presley and these rock and roll acts coming out of the United States. And then later in the 1960s, Cliff Richard masqueraded under a Christian persona. Yeah, right. If Cliff Richard's a Christian, I'm Dan Andrews. Uh, also, Cliff Richard's father, who went by the name of Roger Webb, Cliff's real name is Harry Webb, worked for Thorn EMI, which is a division of the aforementioned EMI record label. Here's Sir Jimmy Savile with Sir Mick Jagger. The Rolling Stones, of course, one of the most influential groups of the 1960s. I've got a whole load on the Rolling Stones. I've got a separate presentation titled Dark Occult Aspects of the Rolling Stones. We don't have time to go into all of that today, but we will be focusing a little bit on the Rolling Stones' rivals, it says here, the Beatles. So these were the two supergroups of the 1960s, really popularised rock and roll and that whole youth culture idea. Here are the Beatles pictured with Jimmy Savile, surprise, surprise. There was actually a period in 1964 where Savile went on tour with the Beatles. He opened up for them, compared their shows, they travelled together in the back of a van. Can you imagine anything worse than being on tour with Jimmy Savile? What a nightmare. As to whether there's a reason why John Lennon and Paul McCartney have been hailed as the greatest singer-songwriter duo of the 20th century, and why the Beatles are arguably the biggest, most successful, most influential pop band in the world, 
Perhaps the clue lies in this picture. Do we have any Freemasons in the house? <laughs> Don't be shy. OK, on the down low today. I'm not a Freemason, despite what many will claim. I've been called worse. But I am told this is a Freemasonic handshake. And this would explain why these two achieved so much success. Because one thing which has become very apparent is that you do not get to be as successful, as prominent as the Beatles without help from those parties that can make these things happen and hand these careers to you. Many a band have tried to work their way up that slippery pole under their own steam, thinking that they can make it with a few good tunes and a few catchy guitar riffs and a bit of hobnobbing, a bit of networking, crossing their fingers for good luck. It's never going to happen. Not unless you're selected for success. That goes for anyone in the public eye. Anyone who's famous, anyone who's a household name, anyone you've heard of, their career will have been provided for them. Exactly, exactly. So here's another very telling image. Here we've got Lennon and McCartney placing their hands inside their jackets. This is an occult signaling method and it denotes the hidden hand. This comes out of Freemasonry, but it's used in other groups as well. The hidden hand represents these secret society networks who actually control all aspects of organized society. And when you see people pictured with their hand inside their jacket like this, it's a way for them to communicate that they're in the club. Others who are in the club will recognize the sign and know what it means. In the same way that the world of politics can be seen to be absolutely controlled from above, through a hierarchy, through a pyramid of power, in the same way that that dynamic plays out in big business, in so-called science, so-called medicine, academia, the military, the mainstream media, it can be shown to occur also in popular culture and entertainment. And if you're prepared to accept that politics and all these other institutions are controlled by hidden, shady power structures, why would they possibly leave untouched the greatest opportunity for mass mind control that there could ever be? Entertainment, popular culture, movies, TV shows, music. These are the ideal vehicles to affect large numbers of people, change their perceptions, their thoughts, and their behaviors. And there's been a fair bit of that over the past three and a half years, hasn't there? And much of it has been achieved through this kind of popular culture. When people think they're just listening to some harmless music, just enjoying themselves, winding down from work from a stressful day, going to watch a movie, watching a bit of TV, their guard is down. Nobody's expecting to have their worldview and their thoughts shaped and molded for them in those circumstances, which is why these make the ideal vehicles for it. Here we've got a picture of Paul McCartney 1.0. I gather the other one is on Australian shores at the moment. But I think he's in Brisbane tonight, so I'm safe. So what we have here is a picture of the original Paul McCartney, and I'm getting to that, with a birdcage over his head. Why should this be? Well, it's symbolizing mind control, which is prevalent throughout the entertainment industry. There are various ways of symbolically communicating this, and we'll see a fair few as we go along. So here again, we've got the original Paul McCartney, 1.0, and he's pictured with his girlfriend in the 1960s, 
the actress Jane Asher. Over on the left, we've got Jane's father, Dr. Richard Asher. Dr. Asher was involved in research into hypnosis and dreams. That's what he studied. So it's mind control by any other name. He had a clinic in his home in Wimpole Mews, central London. And Paul and Jane lived there for a long period in the 1960s. So Dr. Asher was conducting his experiments while Paul was living at that address. Arguably, Paul McCartney's most famous song, which is credited to him, is Yesterday. Yesterday, it turns out, is based upon a much earlier Italian aria tune. You can get it on YouTube. There's an Italian singer and he's singing this original melody which predates yesterday by a few decades and you can hear blatant similarities between the two songs. Dr. Asher's wife was a music teacher. She taught Sir George Martin, the producer of the Beatles, known as the fifth Beatle, to play the oboe. So she was into classical music and world music. So she would have been familiar with Italian aria style or what's sometimes known as Neapolitan song. So Paul McCartney says that one morning he woke up with the melody to yesterday in his head. Says it came to him in a dream and he sang the melody to a few friends because he was, he was worried he might have plagiarized it from somewhere. What many researchers now believe is that that tune was purposefully implanted into Paul McCartney's mind by Dr. Asher as part of his studies into what could be achieved through dreams and hypnosis and how consciousness could be affected. So that melody was gifted to McCartney. He woke up believing that he'd written this song in his head and that's where yesterday came from. Dr. Asher didn't have a particularly dignified end. So in 1969, when Paul had split from Jane after he'd been having an affair with Linda and then Paul married Linda, Dr. Asher went missing from his London home for a week. His body then turned up in the cellar and the official verdict was Suicide. It's all very strange and when it comes to the wider Beatles story, there is a very high body count, unfortunately. Here are two pictures of Paul McCartney with Jane Asher in the 1960s. Anyone see any discrepancies there? So roughly the same height in one and in the other, Paul is towering above Jane. He's not wearing stack heels. We can see this. So what's happened is Paul has been switched out. On the left, we're no longer looking at the original Paul McCartney. And it's not until you place these pictures side by side that the anomalies become so obvious. So if you'd presented either of those pictures to the average person in the street and said, who's this? They'd have said, well, it's Paul McCartney. But it's not until you put them side by side that you think, hmm, can that actually be the same man? Which was version one? Version one is on the left. Version two is presumably the guy we have today. So this whole story was covered in this book, which appeared in 2009, called The Memoirs of Billy Shears. So the official conspiracy theory surrounding this is that the original Paul McCartney died in 1966. And the date that we're given for this is the 11th of September, 9-11-66, reportedly in a car crash. The guy that is said to have replaced him is said to be named William Shepard 
or Billy Shepherd or Billy Shears. So in the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club album opening track, where you get the lyric, may I introduce to you the one and only Billy Shears, that's supposedly the public's introduction to the guy who had taken over the public role of Paul McCartney. So this idea is explored in this book. It's credited to an author and an encoder by the name of Thomas E. U. Harriet, and it claims to be the tell-all autobiography of Billy Shears, the guy who took over the role of Paul McCartney. It's presented as historical fiction. The reason they had to call it that is because it comes with plausible deniability. There are some very wild and bold claims in this book. It talks of the original Paul having been taken out as some sort of ritual sacrifice for the dark occultists who control the industry. The only way they would have got away with making claims like that in that book is to dress it up as fiction. That way they can claim that if anyone tries to take them to court or take any sort of legal action against them, well, you know, we told you it was fiction, but actually it contains a whole load of truth, which can be shown to be so. So it claims to be Billy Shears explaining how and why he came to take on the public role of Paul McCartney. It's encoded in many different ways. It's very cryptic. It's very cleverly written. There's been a number of different versions which have appeared over the years. And if anyone wants to take an even deeper dive into all of this, I would definitely recommend the work of Mike Williams, otherwise known as Sage of Quay. Anyone heard of Mike Williams and his work? Not many, okay. So if you go to sageofquay.com, and the Quay is spelled Q-U-A-Y, like key. He's got a whole load of videos. He's got hours and hours worth of research into this story on the formation of the Beatles and the question of whether it's actually possible for the Beatles to have written all the songs that they've been credited with. Mike did a four and a half hour presentation in 2020. He made good use of his lockdown time asking whether Lennon and McCartney can possibly have written all the songs on the Beatles' Rubber Soul album when you look at all the other activities that they were undertaking in that period, Mike's demonstrated that it's physically impossible for them to have written all, all those songs and for them to have all have been recorded in the time that we're told they were. And if that's the case for that one short period in the Beatles' career, it's probably the case for their entire career. And as I say, Mike presents some very plausible arguments for this. So anyone wanting any homework, there's some deep dives to be had there. So the guy that replaced him is said to be called Billy. And there are many clues to back this idea up. I've got a couple of examples here, a couple of videos. The first one involves McCartney meeting with Olivia Harrison, who is George Harrison's widow, and their son Danny at a sort of awards do, and listen to what Olivia says to him. What's it like to do what? It's lovely. No, excuse me, I've got to say it to my friend. Hello. Okay, so if his name's Paul, why say hello, Billy? Hmm. And here's another one. This is the actor Dana Carvey, who was in Wayne's World, and he's relating an anecdote concerning a time when he met McCartney and had a conversation with him. Listen carefully to what he says. You know that lyric in the chorus, one day we'll stand up on top of the mountain with our flag unfurled, but it won't be soon enough. And he just lit up. He just lit up. Well, that was a song, you know, I thought it was just a big flag, you know, up on the top of the mountains, and, you know. And then, and, and then that was it. That was it. We were fast friends after that. So I think with Billy, um, people like it. If you take one of his obscure songs or obscure album and be very specific, 
Oops. So he's talking about Paul McCartney, and then he says, well, you know, with Billy. Well, who's Billy then? I thought we were talking about Paul. There's a town in New York State, Westchester County, by the name of Scarsdale, and it's piqued my interest. Yoko Ono spent some time growing up there when her family relocated from Japan to the United States. Yoko Ono is descended from Japanese royalty. She, on her mother's side, hails from the family of the one-time emperor of Japan. And her father ran a prominent Japanese banking dynasty. I believe, as do many other researchers, that Yoko was put in as John Lennon's handler. She was quite a few years older than him. It was a most unlikely relationship. John Lennon had a few mother issues, a few hang-ups. His own mother died when he was 14 years of age, when she was knocked down by an off-duty policeman. Paul McCartney's mother died when he was 15, so they both suffered that trauma at a similar kind of age. So John Lennon had a sort of mother-shaped gap in his life, and it seems Yoko fulfilled that. His nickname for her was Mother, and it really seems as if she was sent into his world to keep an eye on him and to direct his activities. Many researchers feel that she would have been implicated in his assassination in some way as well. But either way, Yoko spent some time in Scarsdale. Also in Scarsdale was a young woman by the name of Linda Eastman, or to give her her original family name, Linda Epstein. So her father's name was Lee Eastman, but that was an Americanized version of his real name. He was a Lithuanian Jew by the name of Leopold von Epstein. And he became an attorney, based himself in Scarsdale, New York County, uh, New York State. And that's where Linda grew up, attended high school, spent her formative years there. Of course, both these women went on to marry Beatles. John Lennon, Paul McCartney. So what are the chances of two women from the same obscure little town in New York State going on to marry the two most prominent singer-songwriters of the 20th century? What are the chances of that just being random? Or is it far more likely that there's something to know about Scarsdale and what goes on there? Many famous people I've come out of Scarsdale. There's a whole list of them. You can actually get a Wikipedia page on the town and it lists all these famous people. They include Liza Minnelli and the actor Noah Schnapp, most recently seen in Stranger Things. Stranger Things indeed. And another Sir, just before we leave this section, Sir George Martin, known as the fifth Beatle. He was the sonic wizard, if you like, behind all those incredible studio productions that the Beatles produced in their latter stages. Most of that was coming through George Martin. Prior to becoming a producer for EMI, he worked at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. And that place is concerned with experimenting with sound and sound frequencies and seeing what can be achieved through the manipulation of them. So much of what he learnt there would have been put to use in those studio recordings that he made for the Beatles. I've got another presentation titled Dark Occult Aspects of the Beatles, which goes on for about two and a half hours. So that's online somewhere for anyone that does want a deeper dive into all of that. And so we move on to the most compelling set of connections between music and the military that I think is possible to get. And we study this landmark piece of work by the author and researcher, Dave McGowan. 
It's called Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. Just as a matter of interest, anyone in the room read this book? I'm reading it now. Reading it now, great. Okay, about three of you. Well, I definitely recommend a read of this one because it's extremely revealing. So Dave McGowan was a builder, but he was also a music fan and he loved the music of the mid to late 1960s growing up in LA. One time he went on holiday and he had a book with him all about a district in the Hollywood Hills of LA known as Laurel Canyon. And he read this book and he came to realize that virtually every influential band behind the counterculture, flower power, hippie, sort of psychedelic music scene of the mid to late 1960s congregated around Laurel Canyon. This was a strange thing because prior to the mid 60s, Laurel Canyon had no musical heritage whatsoever. No music clubs, no recording studios, no record labels, but for some reason, bands and musicians were coming from all over the United States, from Canada, the likes of Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, many others, even from the UK, bands like The Animals. And they were all being drawn magnet-like, for some reason, to Laurel Canyon. One thing that was in that area was a covert military intelligence research base known as Lookout Mountain. This produced propaganda films on behalf of the American government and military. And it seems to hold the key to why so many of these musicians were being drawn to this area. What McGowan found when he did some digging into the backgrounds of these musicians was that almost without exception, you had connections into the military, aspects of military intelligence, CIA, FBI, the Pentagon, the Defense Department, aspects of American government, aristocratic bloodline families, secret societies like the Freemasons, Bohemian Club, the Century Club. And the best example we have to make the point, I feel, is that of Jim Morrison, frontman of The Doors. Top left, we have a picture from 1964 of a young James Douglas Morrison. He's on the ship that his father commanded. That's him on the right, Admiral George Stephen Morrison. His biggest claim to fame is that he was the Navy Admiral in charge of the fleet of ships involved in the Gulf of Tonkin false flag incident which springboarded America into the Vietnam War. Meanwhile, you've got his son as the front man of a group which was all about pushing drugs, pushing psychedelic culture and ostensibly being anti-war and anti-establishment. So how can this be? Many make excuses for Jim by saying, well, he was just rebelling against his father's values. You know, kids often do this. And if this was an isolated example, we could write it off as just that. But it's not. Jim Morrison was an actor. You can find on YouTube an ad from 1964, the year before he emerged as the frontman of The Doors, where he's advertising Florida State University. So he's in a college blazer, he's got his books under his arm, and he's doing this ad for this university. And a year later, he's out there on stage with his shirt off, getting drunk, exposing himself, pushing drink, pushing drugs, and he's a legend. He's become the poster child for that counterculture generation. That was an acting role that Jim was given by virtue of who his father was. Because the sons and daughters of high-ranking military personnel are put to use in social engineering psyops. They're the ones they choose to get the job done. The counterculture scene 
of the 60s was a military grade operation and it was designed to change society, to change societal values. The generation they had in their crosshairs were known as the baby boomers. They were the generation born directly after the Second World War and the years immediately following and they were coming, coming of age in the mid to late 1960s. So they had this whole thing aimed squarely at them. The Doors example is very, very far from the only one we get from Dave McGowan's book. He lists any number of bands and musicians all coming out of Laurel Canyon because that's the place that was chosen to bring them all together because of its military connections. So, for example, the father of the Mamas and the Papas star, John Phillips, was also a career Marine Corps officer. And his mother, sister and first wife were all career employees of the Defence Department at the Pentagon. Furthermore, John Phillips' first wife, Susie Adams, was a direct descendant of John Adams, America's second president. Even Phillips himself went to West Point and was being prepped for a military career. None of these people just emerge organically. They're chosen for these roles. Another example that he gives is that of Frank Zappa. And Frank Zappa was always thought of as being anti-establishment and he poked fun at that whole counterculture hippie scene. But his father worked in biological weapons research at the Edgewood Arsenal military base. You can barely find a musician from that community in those times who didn't have those kind of family connections, usually through the fathers. And just as a footnote on Dave McGowan, that book came out in 2014. By the end of 2015, Dave McGowan was dead. He passed away on the 22nd of November, the anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, also a date which figures strongly in a certain Australian artist who we'll be exploring in part two. And McGowan died of an extremely aggressive and fast acting form of cancer. We can make of that what we will. But either way, he left behind an incredible legacy of work which has influenced many other researchers, myself included, and I think we owe him a huge debt for opening our eyes to all of this because having read what he wrote in that book, it set me on a particular path of research and I've uncovered a whole load of stuff which I wouldn't have done if it weren't for his work. So hats off to him. It wasn't just musicians who were used in the 1960s to push psychedelic culture and to change all these societal attitudes. Another example of a cultural hero would be Dr. Timothy Leary. So he was a Harvard professor and he was evidently kicked out of his academic role because he embraced psychedelic culture and the pushing of LSD and he encouraged his students to go on these amazing journeys of discovery in their consciousness by taking LSD, acid as it was known. So this stuff was everywhere in those times. There were other more natural compounds like peyote, mescaline, psilocybin mushrooms which were getting pushed, but laboratory produced LSD was the main one. And all roads led back to the CIA. So the CIA is supposed to be there to keep Americans safe from harm. The truth of the matter is the exact opposite. They're there to cause harm. And it's exactly the same with the intel agencies of any other nation. MI5, MI6 in Britain is causing all the harm that goes on in society. So Leary's out there encouraging his students to turn on, tune in, drop out. That was the mantra of the times. What it meant was drop out of regular society, get stoned, take acid, listen to all this incredible trippy new psychedelic music and don't worry about the war in Vietnam, 
don't get involved in all of that. Don't worry about political activism. Just go on these trips, man, you know. That's what it was all about. In his later years, Leary admitted to having been on the payroll of the CIA. So he was a CIA asset all along, and his pushing of all these ideas was part of this bigger social engineering psyop that was going on. Another one was Gloria Steinem, credited with being the mother of modern feminism. She was the proprietor of Ms. Magazine, and she popularized the idea of women being the equal of their male counterpart in the workplace. So her whole thing was, hey sisters, we can be just like the men, we can do anything they can do, so we can get out there and do all the jobs that they do. The idea here was to get women away from their traditional nurturing roles within the household as mothers into the workplace so that their children would get put in the care of the state at ever earlier ages so that they could be propagandized. And then the women help to contribute towards the taxation system coming through the corporations. So it's a win-win if you're a psychopath. And it was all part of a big agenda. The idea was to break up the traditional family unit. And again, to sow discord among the young people of the time and their parents' generation and value systems. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that the ripples from what was getting done in the 1960s to society are still being felt today. It was changing attitudes to everything, to music, to sex, to family, to relationships, to drugs. All of that got done in the 1960s, and it was a military-grade operation. A band which really popularized those times and were cultural heroes were the Grateful Dead, so-called. Before they were known as the Grateful Dead, they were called the Warlocks, but they changed their name, and when you do some background studies into the members of this band, it doesn't disappoint. Bob Weir, one of the members, actually attends regular meetings at Bohemian Grove. This is where politicians and business leaders all get together once a year in this area of California Redland Forest and they dress up in robes in front of this 40-foot stone owl and dance around a bonfire. I mean, we all do it, it's regular stuff. You know. <laughs> Just normal activity. Uh, so Bob Weir attends that. Then we've got connections through the various members into Freemasonry, into the Century Club, into aristocratic bloodline families. It's all there. And by the way, the one-time music publisher for the Grateful Dead, who was also one of their road managers, was a dude by the name of Alan Trist. Alan Trist's father was Eric Trist, who was one of the founding members of the Tavistock Institute of Human Affairs in London. Tavistock is, I would say, the major social engineering think tank in the world. They come up with all these different ways of changing people's thoughts and ideas and shaping and molding their perceptions in society. And I would argue that to a very large extent, the COVID scam would have been cooked up at Tavistock and then exported around the world. So we have the road manager of this group and his father is one of the founding members of that organization. One of the other road managers of the Grateful Dead was a guy named Hank Harrison, who, as well as being the biological father of Courtney Love, Kurt Cobain's widow, was also in the employ of the CIA. I'm glad you're all sitting down to recover from the shock. More connections which help to illustrate the point come through Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters, 
and also Nirvana in the Kurt Cobain years. He was in that band. Here he is giving it a Masonic shush sign denoting the keeping of secrets, oaths of allegiance. Also with a devil's fork, tells you a bit about his true nature. Let's have a look at his background. So his father, James Harper Grohl, worked in politics as an assistant to Robert A. Taft Jr. Robert's father was William Howard Taft, the 27th president of the United States. And his father was Alfonso Taft, the founder of the Skull and Bones Occult Secret Society operating out of Yale University. During John Kerry's presidential campaign in 2004, Dave Grohl joined the trail and dedicated the album In Your Honor to the former Skull and Bones man. You can't get much more rock and roll than that, right? I love this story. I've told this one a hundred times and it never gets boring. Meet the Copelands. The patriarch of this family was a guy named Miles Axe Copeland. He was a career CIA officer. He had postings all around the world. He was a legend in intel circles. And he had three sons who were all put to use in the music industry. From the left, we have Ian Copeland, now deceased. In the middle, Stuart Copeland, who you might recognize as the drummer with the group The Police. And then on the right, Miles Copeland Jr. So between them, these three had management companies, a record label, they had a show on MTV where they would only showcase artists on their own roster, and they very much had a stranglehold over the punk and new wave scene in both Britain and America from the late 1970s onwards. So basically, you could not be successful within those genres as a band unless you went through the Copelands. They did like to give a bit of a clue as to their true nature in the way they named their operations. So they had a holding company, which they called Copeland International Artists, or CIA. They also had a, a booking agency, which was called Frontier Booking International. <laughs> they had a record label named International Records Syndicate. And of course, their house band was The Police. As in, they were there to police all the other groups on the scene. That's The Police with Sting, as in a sting operation. What's a sting operation? It's one that takes you by surprise and you don't see it coming. Here's Stuart Copeland in an interesting pose. This is one of many hand signals that we see these assets flashing up, the so-called Baphomet horned hand sign. Pretty much every celebrity in the world has been pictured flashing up this sign at some point or other. Nothing creepy about that, right? Let's have a look at Bono, if we must. Bono has always sounded to me like the name of a pet dog. You know, here Bono, come on boy. boy. And that's quite appropriate because he is a bit of a poodle, he's a bit of a lap dog, you know, he's a bit of a bag man for the globalists, he runs errands. Here he is hanging out with George Bush and Bill Clinton, Bill Gates, Tony Blair, Al Gore, people like that. So here a question arises. If Bono is just a rock singer, what's he doing hanging out with the likes of these? Not that you'd want to, but I'm just asking. Well, the answer to the question is that Bono is a little more than just a rock singer. That's how he got his start, of course, and he became known to the public as the singer with U2. But he stands as a good example of new generations of important bloodline families who are given influential positions. This woman was known as Barbara Hewson. She was an Irish lawyer. 
Her main claim to fame is that she campaigned for the age of consent for adults to be able to have sex with children to be lowered to 13. Nice lady. This researcher, Johnny Vedmore, has connected her with Bono. So Bono's real name is Paul David Hewson, turns out to be a cousin of Barbara Hewson. So both of them were given influential roles in society and both of them changed the perceptions of various people in society. The reason Bono hangs out with Bill Gates and people like that is because he's helping to push New World Order agendas. United Nations 2030, the Great Reset, all of this. And he's a good example of a lifetime actor. This is a term that was coined by the author and researcher Joe Atwill. And it describes someone who's in the public eye and they're known for one thing or another. They might be a Hollywood actor, they might be a famous politician, they might be a musician, and that's how people think of them. But the truth of the matter is that they spend their entire lives pushing agendas. They have to be made familiar to the public first so that everyone knows who they are. And they build a fan base and the fans come to trust them. So then anything they push, large numbers of people are likely to go along with it. You two are still pushing agendas to this day. This is a brief piece of video footage from a show that they performed at The Sphere, new venue in Las Vegas, just last month. Look at the amount of subliminal messages that were getting flashed up on the screen and getting soaked up like a sponge in the subconscious minds of the audience. I like to use the phrase, a lifetime actor's work is never done, because decade after decade, they push agendas. Bono couldn't retire if he wanted to. That's why Sir Paul McCartney is touring Australia in his 80s, when he would probably prefer to be taking it easy at home. Who wants to be hawking it around on the tour circuit in their 80s? It's because they're not allowed to retire. Here's Bono giving another familiar hand signal. This is the so-called 6661. That number is very much favoured by the dark occultists who control these industries. It crops up absolutely everywhere and they like to communicate it to us in many different ways. Here he is with Sting, all pals together. Here we've got Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits, Paul McCartney 2.0, so, sorry, Sir, Sir Paul McCartney. Uh, Sir George Martin, and there's Sting. And look what he's doing with his hand. Inside his jacket, in exactly the same way as we saw before. The hidden hand, meaning Sting is part of the club. How could he not be when he's in a band called The Police? Geldof says to Bono, they know, it's a favorite meme. Yes, we do these days. And that brings us on to Bob Geldof. In the second half of this talk, by the way, I'm going to be focusing in on a whole bunch of Australian artists. So I've fine structured this talk because I thought Aussie crowds might find it interesting to have a look at some Aussie artists. So I've lined some of that stuff up for part two. Uh, Bob Geldof pops up there. I think you probably all know how. But anyway, for now, will just focus on his KBE. This is a knighthood, a knight of the British Empire. How's that work then if he's an Irishman? He's not a full-blooded Irishman as it turns out. He's actually half Jewish on his mother's side. But anyway, Bob Geldof is another great example of a lifetime actor. So he first became famous 
as the lead singer with the Boomtown Rats. I do find that if you're going to be the lead singer in a band, it kind of helps if you can sing. <laughs> but it didn't seem to hold him back. Anyway, it doesn't matter because that was cover. That was the cover story for who he really was. So he had to become famous first. So he had, had a few hits, I Don't Like Mondays, which was all about mind control, by the way. And then by 1984, of all years, everyone knew who he was. And that's when his real work began. That was the year that he put out that Band-Aid Christmas record, Do They Know It's Christmas? And he brought together all the pop stars of the time, and they all made this record for charity, and it led to the Live Aid concert of 1985. What all this was there to do was to lay the foundations very early on for what we're now seeing come to fruition very rapidly, the New World Order Master Plan. So this Agenda 2030 thing that they're trying to get in place, certain provisions were being made towards that back in the mid-1980s. So part of what the Band-Aid Live Aid thing was about was going into Africa mass vaccinating swathes of the African public and plundering natural resources and just getting everything ready for the other pieces of the puzzle that they wanted to put in place in the years to follow. It was a very interesting thing listening to many of the musicians who took part in that Band-Aid record. So I've seen many documentaries and they all recount the same sort of story which is well, the phone rang and it was Bob Geldof and he said, we're making this charity record, get your ass in the studio Sunday, you're going to be there. And you don't say no to Bob Geldof. That's what they said. Well, why not? It's because it was known that he was a very powerful and connected individual. Not just some scruffy singer from Dublin, you know, a little bit more than that. Anyway, as I say, more of it in part two. Blame it on the bloodlines. So key to why certain people become famous and successful lies in their ancestry, genealogy and DNA. It's all about important family bloodlines going back in many cases several generations. So new generations of the same families are ushered into these positions. They don't let just anyone become presidents, become pop stars, become Hollywood actors, as we'll see. Another great example of all this came straight from the horse's mouth via Esther Jinx Dawson. She was the front woman of a group called Coven. Lovely group. They had a really nice album in 1968 called Witchcraft Destroys Minds and Reaps Souls. It's lovely. I'll play it to the kids. And on the back of the album, you have an actual satanic black mass being depicted. So Jinx Dawson headed up that group. And here, in her own words, is who she is. I'm of the Mayflower Society, a direct descendant of John Howland, 13th signatory to the Mayflower Compact. Members of my family were also active in Freemasonry. My father was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason, and my grandfather, a former Lieutenant Governor of Indiana, was High Priest of the Royal Arch Masons. My great-grandfather was in the private circle of US President Teddy Roosevelt, and we're listed in the book, The First Families of America, so I am steeped in American Illuminati. She said it herself. And then she pops up in that group, depicting witchcraft. Go figure. Madonna. Now, we have, in so many cases, what Mike Williams has referred to as the Cinderella fairy story of how certain people become famous. He coined that phrase for the Beatles. So the Cinderella fairy story for the Beatles is that it was four regular working class lads from Liverpool, put a band together, wrote a few songs, came up with a few catchy guitar riffs, punted around a few demo tapes, got a 
record deal with EMI, and the rest is history. It's a very simplistic way of explaining where people come from. And here's another one. This is Madonna's Cinderella fairy story. She says, I went to New York, I had a dream. I wanted to be a big star. I didn't know anybody. I wanted to dance, I wanted to sing. I wanted to do all those things. I wanted to make people happy. I wanted to be famous. I wanted everybody to love me. I wanted to be a star. I worked really hard and my dream came true. That's all it takes, folks. You know, cross your fingers for good luck and you too could be as successful as Madonna. Uh, you couldn't. And as it turns out, you wouldn't want to be. Anyway, on the back of her jacket here, we have a very interesting symbol. So this is from the movie Desperately Seeking Susan, 1985, early days in her career. And we've got a jacket with an Illuminati pyramid and an all-seeing eye in the capstone. So the public was being told back then who Madonna really was, but very few would have had the eyes to see it. These days, we know different. Lady Gaga, where did she come from? Well, when she first emerged, a lot of people said, oh, she reminds me of Madonna. Yeah, they're cousins, <laughs> it turns out. That's why Lady Gaga's famous. Madonna is also cousins with Ellen DeGenerate, <laughs> the TV chat show host. Also, would you believe Madonna is a cousin of Justin Trudeau? All coming out of French Canada. And it's all on Madonna's mother's side. So, as with Yoko Ono, it's the mother's bloodline which is important. Her name was Madonna Louise Fortin, so she shares the same two names as uh, her daughter. Madonna's father was Tony Ciccone, Silvio. He worked for Chrysler in their military tank division. But the mother is connected to Trudeau and all these others. So now you know why Madonna was ushered into fame. She's also a cousin, would you believe, of Camilla, the wife of Lord Sausage Fingers, <laughs> as he's come to be known. I can't take the title King Charles seriously. I just can't. I've got a good friend, Lance, from Rise Above TV, really great show in the UK, and he coined the phrase Lord Sausage Fingers for Charles, and it's really taken off. <laughs> You know, in the UK, a lot of people now are calling him Lord Sausage Fingers. There's lots of great slang coming out of the UK. There's a really good show called Sheep Farm. Anyone listen to Sheep Farm Studios? A couple of you. Definitely recommend it. A couple of great guys, Dom and Chris. They're out of Yorkshire. They're no nonsense. They have a laugh with their show. Do great research, but they have a laugh with it. And they've coined certain slang phrases. So, uh, for this, because you couldn't say it in YouTube videos, they started to call it the arm spear. And then that came to be known as the Britney Spears. And uh, if you wanted to say that somebody had received that, you know, you'd say they've gone to a Britney Spears concert. <laughs> and their other name for it was the three dart finish. Like in darts, you know? Three darts and you're finished. Yeah? So, Madonna's related to Camilla. And here we have the extended family tree involving all of them. So this is based around Village Idiot Bush, and it was professional genealogists who put this one together. It appeared in the mainstream. It was in one of the UK newspapers. So Bush, it turns out, is related to his own vice president, Dick Cheney. They're cousins. He was also related to John Kerry, his opponent in the 2004 US election, they both attended Skull and Bones at Yale University. So in 2004, American voters were being asked, who do you want to be your next president? This cousin from Skull and Bones or this cousin from Skull and Bones? Ain't democracy great? 
Thank God we don't live in a dictatorship where our leaders are served up to us, eh? We have choice, don't you know? So George Bush is also a cousin of Barack Obama. And there we've got Madonna, Celine Dion's in there, she's a cousin of Madonna. We've got Marilyn Monroe, Brad Pitt, Tom Hanks. One way or another, all these people are related. Uh, Bush is descended from Abraham Lincoln, and yet people still believe that their vote makes a difference and that they're getting to choose who their leaders are. Presidents aren't elected, they're selected. Same thing with prime ministers. Another thing that popular culture and music is used for is the phenomenon that's known as predictive programming. This is conditioning the public for something which is known to be coming. So they place depictions of it into popular culture vehicles. It might be a cartoon, the Simpsons have previous it might be a movie, it might be a music video, it might be an ad. It's a real world event that is known to be coming. And it's what the news anchors, when they pop up on the TV screens, are gonna ask people to believe. So if depictions of this have already been drip fed into the subconscious mind of the public through vehicles such as this, the story is more readily accepted when it comes along. That's one aspect of it. Also there's the dynamic of energy goes where attention flows. So if you have millions of people focusing their consciousness on a particular idea or a particular event, it can actually help to bring it into physical manifestation because we create our own experienced reality with our consciousness. And then the third reason why this gets done is because the occultists, the sick ones, believe that somehow they can cheat the forces of karma, karmic retribution, by placing the emphasis for something they plan to do away from them onto us. They think that if they gain our tacit approval for something, they're off the hook. They think if we don't say no, it's as good as us saying yes. It's a very sick, twisted way of looking at things, but these are very sick, twisted people. Mentally ill, deranged maniacs. Anyway, the term predictive programming was coined by the late Scottish researcher Alan Watt. Got a short excerpt here where he's talking a bit further about it. He does speak in a bit of a monotone, it's a bit flat, but uh, it's still an important message. And it's downloaded a virus into your subconscious and you're being programmed and it's called predictive programming. The technique is ancient and it has no old science. Plato in his Republic talks about the, the, the culture industry of his own day and how it, it was essential not only for maintaining control over the people by the elite, but that they had to control everything that was given to the public. In other words, anything the public saw in drama on stage was authorised. I think probably the best example we have of predictive programming in action comes from the events of 9-11. And they go back all the way to the 1960s. Construction on the World Trade Center towers began in earnest in 1968. In 1968, a landmark movie was released, Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. And it prophesied an event of huge significance happening 33 years into the future, 33 being a very important number in Freemasonry and in occult studies. And the title of that movie was 2001, which was the year of the 9-11 attacks. In 1967, Newsweek magazine published this issue with David Rockefeller, that nice man, 
on the front cover. Rockefeller funded and was a, a guiding force behind the construction of the World Trade Center towers. It's noted that in this picture he's wearing a wristwatch and the hands on the watch are set to 9 and 11. This, according to many researchers, indicates foreknowledge of what was going to happen on 9-11 of 2001 all the way back when those towers were being constructed. Many believe, and I concur, that those towers were built for the specific purpose of being brought down in a mass occult Freemasonic ritual 33 years into the future on that chosen date of 9-11-2001. So many examples of aspects of what we saw that day in movies and cartoons in the decades leading up to it, all getting soaked up by the subliminal mind of the viewing public. Some examples from the music world. We got this album from a little known rap group called The Coup. They had an album called Party Music, which was released in June of 2001. So it's just a few weeks before those events. And what we see is those towers exploding in exactly the way they did in September. And down the front, you got the front man of the group holding a remote control detonator. Go figure. Here's the real classic for anyone that's not seen this before. This is a Jaws to the Floor one. The album Breakfast in America by the British group Supertramp. So this came out in 1979. We have an image of the Manhattan skyline. It's a breakfast tray made to look like Manhattan. It's a view from an aeroplane window coming in at breakfast time. And you've got the name of the group, Supertramp, up at the top. If you do a mirror image reversal of this sleeve, you now get this. Where the U and the P of Supertramp used to be, above those towers, you now have a 9 and an 11. Bearing in mind, this is a view from an aeroplane window at breakfast time, the time when those attacks took place. And this was 22 years before the event. Back to you 2 again, sorry. Brief excerpt from one of their videos. This is the opening shot to one of their songs from the 80s. World Trade Center Towers, there for no apparent reason at the start of that video. Name of the song? The Unforgettable Fire. Prince. What to make of Prince? I've got another talk on Prince. Dark occult aspects of Prince. And in Musical Truth Volume 2, I've got a whole essay on the dualistic nature of Prince, written by a friend of mine, Dan Munro. He now lives in Perth. I'm going to see him tomorrow. And the thing about Prince is it always seemed that one minute he was completely owned by the Illuminati control structure and he was doing their bidding and pushing their symbolism and stuff. But at other times it seemed like he was trying to communicate empowering messages to the public. He talked about chemtrails on a TV chat show. So it was always difficult to know what to make of Prince, whether he was completely controlled or whether he'd broken his programming and was actually trying to help humanity. I do tend to lean more towards the latter. But either way, here's an interesting thing. This is an excerpt from a concert that he performed in Utrecht in the Netherlands in December 1998. So this was just less than three years before the events of 9-11 and listen to the dialogue at the end of this concert.
So there it is, he's saying Osama bin Laden, and of course the 9-11 attacks were pinned on him. He didn't do it, but the public was asked to believe that he did. And so he was prepping people for that, and then somebody in the band shouts, 2001, hit me, as if they'd had an inside heads up on what was coming. And as always, the public was the last to know. 2016 was an unlucky year for musicians. So at the start of the year, we were told David Bowie had died. More of that shortly. In April, 21st of April, we're told that Prince had died on the birthday of the Queen. Just a coincidence. And then at the very end of 2016, George Michael turns up dead in bed on Christmas Day. So a man possibly best known for the lyrics, last Christmas I gave you my heart, turns up dead on Christmas Day of heart failure. You couldn't make it up and you don't have to. But there seem to have been many aspects of preparation for the announcement of George Michael's death. I detail many of these in Musical Truth 2. Many TV shows and movies hinted at the idea of George Michael either dead or about to be dead in the years up to 2016. Here's one example. There are many others, but this is a movie called Keanu, written by a guy called Jordan Peele. You've got a character undergoing a sort of out-of-body hallucinatory experience and go into a sort of heavenly realm and this is what he sees. So was George Michael's death known about before it happened? And was he taken out? Well, uh, I've got other presentations on that. But I would suggest that, yes, George Michael was taken out. Uh, I would contend that that happens with some artists, particularly those that become outspoken and try to go against the industry. And George Michael is someone who tried to free himself from his record contract with Sony and was very outspoken about the true nature of the industry, as was Prince, as was Michael Jackson. So back to David Bowie, we're told that in January of 2016, Bowie sadly passed away. The morning after the news broke, Sky News had a story where they wheeled out a guy by the name of Jack Stephen said to be a music industry executive who'd worked with Bowie. Nobody had heard of Jack Stephen up to that point, and little has been heard of him since. This interview used to be all over the internet. It's now very difficult to find it. It's been scrubbed. So I had to jack this copy from someone's site, and it's pretty poor quality, but I think you'll get the picture. Meet Jack Stephen. Does he remind you of anyone? <laughs> and he says there, when I heard the news, it was like a little piece of me had died. <laughs> so some feel that the flesh and blood individual, the living man, David Robert Jones, because that was his real name, lived on, but the persona of David Bowie 
who was an invented character like Ziggy Stardust, had been killed off. And I think that sometimes goes on. I think occasionally artists are allowed to retire from public view, usually after a lifetime of service. And we get little clues and hints offered to us like this. This is obviously a contentious one. Many would argue that that can't possibly be Bowie, but I would say there's a couple of similarities there. And if that one doesn't convince you, let's move on to the next. So Michael Jackson, here he is in childhood, pictured doing that famous 666 sign, suggesting that the control system had their claws into him right from early childhood. We're told that he passed away on the 25th of June, 2009. Just happens to be George Michael's birthday, incidentally. George Michael died on the 25th of December 2016, exactly 10 years to the day after James Brown, who died Christmas Day 2006. So with Michael Jackson, the day after we were told he'd sadly passed away, on Larry King's CNN show, they wheeled out a dude who went by the name of Dave Dave. Anyone know where this one's going? Okay, let's take a look at Dave Dave. Joining us now here in Los Angeles, Miko Brando, who was with us almost every night after this untimely passing. Longtime Michael Jackson friend attending the funeral. And Dave Dave, yes, that's his name, Dave Dave. He was David Rothenberg. He was set on fire in 1983, suffered, as you can see, terrible scars. Michael Jackson befriended him and paid for a lot of his surgeries. Dave Dave is also attending the burial. Why Dave Dave? Well, to liberate myself from the confines of my father's criminality. I he caused the fire? Yeah. He, he is a criminal and he uh, caused all this. To, to free myself of his name and his legacy, I decided to become my own person through changing my name. Could it? Could it be? Many will argue that it is. Right before we take the break then, I just want to play to you a short message which was pre-recorded by the researcher and broadcaster known as Crow777. Any Crow fans? Anyone listen to Crow? Okay, a few of you. Does a great show with his co-host Jason Lindgren. I've been on it a few times. So much information. They release two two-hour podcasts every week, all about truth and freedom topics and sovereignty and personal health and uh, just getting to the truth of everything. And Crow has recorded this message along with Jason for my Australian tour. So Amanda who promoted my Brisbane gig the other day, uh, commissioned this. And I just wanted to play it out because he's specifically addressing these Australian audiences and what these two have to say very much backs up all the points that I've made in this presentation. So let's just take a listen to this and afterwards we'll go for our break. Hello to all the lovely people of Australia. This is Pro from Pro Triple Seven Radio. Jason Lindgren is with me, and we wanted to say a few words to you all. Uh, Jason, you want to say anything before I get started? Well, hello to everyone. Big shout out to Amanda McLeod for putting the event on, and to our friend Mark Devlin, who we know is doing a little mini tour down there in Australia. It was great seeing you over this last weekend from when we're recording this, and thank you for all the kind words, Mark. You're awesome. There you go, Mr. Dublin is a busy man. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments specific to music and um, how media, music, all of it's being used, most of it is controlled at this point. Uh, I became aware of an idea that I coined, and I call it nostalgia programming. And I became aware of it because I read ancient ideas. And I read this quote from a book called Hagakori. I think it's called the Book of Samurai as well. And the quote that got me thinking later about music goes like this. It is said that what is called the spirit of an age is something to which one cannot return. That this spirit gradually dissipates 
is due to the world's coming to an end. For this reason, although one would like to change today's world back to the spirit of 100 years or more ago, it cannot be done. Thus, it is important to make the best of every generation. That quote's always stuck with me, but there was a period in my life when I had the wind knocked out of me and I had to face the facts about the music that was a major portion of my life growing up and what it was used for and what it was actually doing. Now in the long run, I still listen to this music, but not in the same way. And I'll use the example that I took from the book of Hagakuri to talk a little bit about the nostalgic programming. Basically, the music that I loved had been lowered and was lowering my mind and was seeding agendas. And the music that had come before was of a higher musicality and I don't know how, how I would describe it. So I'll roll it up through the 90s into the 2000s now. We currently have music, what is called music, that might not even have a harmony or a melody. When people who are very proficient musicians break it down, they will tell you that there are two basic notes in this song. It has been shown that since basically the 1990s, even to have key changes in a piece of music has become sparse, if not absent altogether. And the reason this matters is because what it demonstrates is the intentional lowering of the human mind. Very few people have probably taken the time to think about what effect music has on culture and society. If we could roll back to some of the classical masters where there was an orchestra with maybe a hundred people and all these dis different classes of instruments and the complexity and the higher minded level at which that music has to be created, delivered and received and compare it to where we've come, we begin to be able to detect the intentionality of the lowering of the human mind. Now, this is where the nostalgia program comes in. While I might listen to music today and not care anything for it or even remember it, there are young people who do. No matter how bad the way I think I think it is or anyone else, those young people will eventually become 30 years old. And many of them at that point, regardless of how inept or non-musical that musical was will be affected by nostalgia because that music or those sounds represent that quintessent time in anyone's life. The first time you got a kiss, uh, the first time you made love, the first time anything or that you did when you were young will instantly rush back to mind when you hear those sounds that represented that period of time. And I point all this out because this is all known. And in the lowering of the human mind, through the lowering of music in this example, I think that we need to become aware of such things in the current era that we're in. Anyhow, Jason, that was a lot of words. What do you want to add? So let's take the idea of the nostalgia programming in music and expand that out to things such as movies. And the example I like to use so much is what they've done to Star Wars since Disney acquired it from George Lucas. There's nostalgia programming, of course, all over the place with the original Star Wars movies and even the prequels because you're hitting two generations there. Now Disney has it and they're doing nothing but using it as a platform to push propaganda and all this modern crap in. Well, the sad thing is, just like you said, in the decades to come, that'll be nostalgic to some people. And that programming is still going to be there. Now the one positive thing I can say about a lot of the modern stuff, and it's not even just Star Wars, it's a lot of these intellectual properties, that are being used to push propaganda, they're actually being rejected by a lot of people. Sometimes the viewership for a lot of these films and TV shows and such that they're absolutely destroying with the propaganda has dropped as low as like 25% of what they had been. So it's great to see that a lot of folks are at least recognizing that it's not what it used to be. And a lot of folks, believe it or not, really are picking up on the fact that they are pushing some really nasty stuff into what's supposed to be escapism and there really isn't much left as far as entertainment just to help you to get away for an hour or two hours whatever it might be just to forget about the modern world that you're dealing with because they keep dragging the modern world 
into everything that you're going to sit down and watch, or even perhaps listen to, because this also includes music. And all across the board, you actually do see a lot of young folks going back and looking at and listening to the older stuff, because they don't like a lot of the newer stuff coming out. It's being recognized that there's just something wrong with it, which <laughs> absolutely there is. As far as this sort of thing is concerned, the best thing that we can do is reject all of it. Do not support anyone who is pushing propaganda on you, your children, our society. Just don't support it, and hopefully they will stop making it. And even if they don't, honestly, there's just so much stuff out there that was made years ago, you've got plenty to entertain yourself with if that's indeed something that you really need. All right, well, I'll tell you what, I hope everyone in Australia begins to have a better existence. I know what you folks are going through. Well, I'm not directly, I don't know, but I'm aware. And I get emails every day and I keep my eye on the pressures that different places in the world are getting. And I know you guys are getting it in spades. I want to wish you the best. I hope you make a lot of friends where you are. And I hope you begin to help one another and build community and strive to become more human than the mainstream wants us to be as they spend all their time using media to try to get us to think poorly of our own species. With that, I'm gonna close with the first line and the last line of the quote that I opened up with that all those years ago got me thinking about the music that I loved with all my heart growing up. It is said that what is called the spirit of an age is something to which one cannot return. Thus, it is important to make the best out of every generation. And with that, I would like to wish each and every one of you a happy, healthy, and higher-minded new era. Jason? Great job in getting together, everyone. And make sure that you pay attention to Mark Devlin, because there's a man who really knows what's up. Cheers. Okay, so, yeah. So it's break time. Uh, are we going for a full hour or are we coming back at 3.30? I don't know. It's uh, 3.45? Okay. So I'll be over here with copies of my books for anyone that's interested. Uh, other than that, enjoy the break and I'll see you at 3.45. Cheers.